coming out here on a very traffic-filled evening. Um, welcome to the Coterie at the Lowe's Hollywood Hotel. My name is Amber Castle, and on behalf of myself and my business partner, Julie Garnier, we are very, very pleased and excited and honored to be presenting the artists you are all here to see tonight. So without further ado, Miss Margaret and Miss Spirito. <laughs> Singing and telling stories. 
And it is uncensored. <laughs> Many people were thrown off by this. I had an old man in Staples as I was cutting up the flyers. He was like, ooh, you do dirty things. I said, no, I'm not. Um, so no dirty things. I just, I curse a lot. Um, it's not a gimmick. It's me. It's who I am. Um, it's kind of like a big joke amongst friends and family. I'm from New Jersey. It's a stereotype. Um, so no, fuck it. If it makes you uncomfortable, I'm sorry. I don't know. That's why it's uncensored. Um, Dave, really quick. Can I get a little more on the monitor and a little less piano? Thank you so much. That's Dave, our sound guy. Welcome everybody. I'm sorry we started a little late. There was a lot of traffic, so we had to wait for some important people. Um, so yes, welcome. I'm so excited to be here at the Coterie. Amber's been trying to get me here for a year and just finally worked out. Um, tonight, you are all going to leave here knowing me. I really am going to be singing some of the best songs I think are around by some of the most talented female artists who have inspired me to be the performer that I am. Some of them, I didn't even know how much they inspired me until I started to put the show together. For instance, is Patsy Klein. Patsy Klein. Um, I loved her and started listening to her before I even knew I could sing. So picture this. We're circa 1986-ish. My parents just get divorced. And my mother moves my sister and I from Elizabeth, New Jersey, all the way to Tom's River, New Jersey, which in my head was like a friggin' country away. It was only an hour, but <laughs> to me it was so far. And the movie, Sweet Dreams, starring Ed Harris and Jessica Lange, is playing constantly at my mom's house and my father's house. My father, um, he loves music. My mother loves it too. They loved music and they both loved Patsy Klein. My dad, he's the type of guy, he knows anything and everything about country music, classic rock, oldies. He knows why they wrote the song, what they ate when they were writing the song, why they broke up with their girlfriend. He knows everything. And I've been there, I remember sitting in his car with my sister, and the song would come on the radio when we were little, and he would school us, he would school us on the subjects of this song, whether we wanted to hear it or not, he would tell us, he didn't care. My mother, she just loved to sing. She loved to sing. She did the plays in high school. She majored in theater in college. But she ended up, she took the safe route. She became an English teacher and a wife and a mother. And I really think if she had had a little bit more support from my grandparents, she would have chosen to pursue it. Um, old school Italian people. We, <laughs> my grandparents believed you get married, you have babies, you have a reliable job. And the job thing, it's questionable if you're a woman. You don't have to do that. You can just get married and have babies as long as you can cook, it's all good. And, uh, you know, I think between the pressure of that, plus the pressure from my father to get married, and just a general lack of confidence, my mom just ended up singing in our kitchen to me and my sister, which were really good times, um, I do remember. But, she, when she moved us to Tom's River, she became friends with a bunch of other single moms, and they started doing karaoke the holiday. It was a big thing. It was like a big night out. And when she would sing, they would record her on cassette tapes, and she would bring them home, and she would play them for my sister and I. And we would sit there and listen, and we, we thought our mom was like becoming famous. We were so excited. And through this karaoke place, they asked her to sing on a telethon on this local TV station. And I remember my sister and I waved and we waved and we waved in front of the TV until she came on. And uh, finally, she got on there, and it was it was so cool. I was like, my mom can do something your mom can't do. And any urge that I had to sing it was just hiding that day. This is the song she sang. Go out walking after midnight Out in the moonlight Just like we used to do I go out walking after midnight Searching for you I walk for miles along the highway Oh, well, it's just my way Oh, saying I love you I go out walking after midnight Searching for you. I stop singing, weeping, we go, lying on this pillow, baby. 
to my parents. We're going to move this over here. Uh, so, you know, my parents, they were always super, super supportive of what I do. From the first time they heard me sing, never questioned it. They still don't question it to this day. They're still not like, Margaret, why did you choose this crazy business? <laughs> they love it. Um, I started singing, honestly, to be noticed. I was not a cute child. I was not. I was, I was ugly. I had people tell me I was ugly. I had little kids say, you are ugly. I had big glasses. I dressed funny. My mother didn't know how to dress me. I just was not a cute kid. And I remember, I wasn't popular, like no one really knew me. And I remember we were having auditions in sixth grade for the Pirates of Penzance. Yes, a Gilbert and Sullivan opera for an elementary school. It's a children's version. And I remember we were all singing. We were all singing together. And Mr. Reedy, our, our chorus teacher, a weird mother father, let me explain this to you, strange dude. He, he heard me singing and he's looking at me. He's like looking at me. And he leans in, he makes everyone stop singing. He said, I just want Margaret to sing. So I sang. I was like, okay, easy. So I was singing, and all the kids in my class, they were like, they, they couldn't believe what they were hearing. And I remember Joel DeFreitas, I remember exactly who it was, looked at me and he said, wow, she's really good. It was a game changer. That was a game changer for me. Because then everyone knew who I was. I was the girl who could sing. I would say I was popular, but I was the girl who could sing. I had an, an identity, and um, I didn't have one before that. And, you know, I sang to get away from things. Musical theater brought me to a different world. You know, my parents got divorced when I was six, and singing took me out of that craziness of all the fighting and all the bullshit about money and all the things kids shouldn't really hear, you know, it's, you know how it is. It's just, it's a situation you don't want to be a part of. And um, there's another singer out there, her name is Pink, you might know, I don't know. Some people like her, some people don't. I love her. Um, I really, I identify with Pink. Um, not just because she's a singer, but because if you listen to her story, she describes that she had to get out of World War III. That's how she felt her home was like. It was World War III. And she used her talent to get away from that. There's this song that I'm about to sing that the first time I heard it, I instantly, instantly connected with it as if she came into my head, saw my thoughts, and then started singing them. The lyrics, they're just so honest. They're so straightforward. It made me fall in love with her as a lyricist. And you know, she wrote the song, she was in her mid-twenties. So it was years, years and years after her parents got a divorce. And you know, you know that the feelings of being from a broken family, they never go away. And even as a married adult, you still, you still have to deal with the issues that come from that. You just eventually, you learn how to deal with them. So, this is family portrait.
I was not the only one who could sing and dance, but he knew I could deliver. He knew I would deliver, he knew I would do it well. He made me Ava Peroni to be that. I was the acid queen of Tommy, I was the beggar woman in Sweeney Todd. I, I would kill to play these roles right now. I would, I'm like begging people. I can do it, I promise. Um, but as much as he loved me, and as good as he was to me, we had a meeting right before I graduated. And at that meeting, he tells me, now not in this necessarily one right after the other, but in this meeting, he says to me, Margaret, you're not gonna work in this business till you're older, way out of your 20s. You're funny looking, and you shouldn't wear tight clothes because our eyes go right to your big hips. That's what this motherfucker sent me out into the world. That was the advice I got. You're not gonna work for at least 10 years. Um, you look retarded and you're fat. That's it, that's what I got out of that conversation. I was devastated. I was like, oh my God, this, this man who, who just was my mentor, who told everyone how good I was, he, this is what he thinks of me? Like, what, what's gonna happen? I was so lost, I was lost. I left college, I didn't know what to do. Do I do musical theater? Do I try to do TV and film? Do I just go to a music studio and record? I'm subletting this apartment in Elmhurst, Queens for dirt cheap with two dudes I barely knew, never saw. I was literally being stalked by the building of the super of the building. His son was stalking me. I had all my private information and knew it. Um, that was fun. And I was waitressing in Manhattan and I hated life. I fucking hated life. I wanted to go back to college. I, that was, I was like, please, someone, I want to go be the star again. Um, this whole time, I was listening to a lot of music. You ride the subway a lot, you gotta listen to a lot of music. Alicia Keys, songs on A minor, Christina Aguilera, Stripped, and India Ari, Acoustic Soul. India Ari, guys, is the shit. She's the shit, she is underrated, and she deserves more credit than she gets. Um, first of all, her voice. Being a proud alto, it was refreshing to not hear a woman try to blow out her vocal cords while she was singing. She made a meal out of all her music using her lower register, and it gave me hope that the friggin' high belters and sopranos were not taking over the goddamn world, because that's how it really seemed back then. That altos had no hope. So I was like, yay, an alto, and she's good. Um, and then her lyrics, they're just brilliant, they're beautiful, they're honest. I mean, you can't get better than Indy Ari, honestly. This next song, it is one of my all-time favorites. Um, for a long time, I, I thought it was my theme song. I
famous by Mary J. Blige. Made yeah. famous. She didn't originally do it. She made it. That's what I said. That is also the song that I sang on Amateur Night for the Apollo. Yeah. That was an experience. Um, yeah, my, my family and friends thought I was nuts. Um, my white friends, actually, they were like, um, why do you want to do that? Because they you know, you get rejected, you get booed off. All my black and Spanish friends were like, you'll be fine, don't even worry about it. Um, so, yeah, so I was pretty scared. I had to think it was not a big deal, but I, I was nervous, because I don't get booed off. I don't get booed off. Margaret and Spirito is not to boot off the stage, so there was no way that was going to happen, right? Um, about a week before the show, I'm sitting in my room and I'm watching like E Hollywood True Story, or it was like, you know, behind the music, something like that. And it was on Dave Chappelle, um, who got booed off at the Apollo, telling the story. Fuck me. Dave Chappelle is black, and he's famous. What am I gonna do? What, like, really, like, what hope did I have? I was so nervous. So the day of, you know, I'm on stage, or I'm waiting, I'm waiting to go on, and they make me go first. I just want to explain something to you. Right before the first person goes on, all the audience hears is, if you don't like them, you boo them. Boo them if you don't like them. I walk on, I rub the stump, and there's people, there's people, like bigger, a section bigger than this whole room, booing. I haven't even started singing yet. Booing me. The band starts playing that song, and I like poop my pants. I'm like, um, I don't know what I'm gonna do. So I just sang, I did my thing, I stayed focused. Now, people are not just booing me, people are screaming for me. Because you have to cheer too. You have to like make sure you let them know you like the person. So imagine singing through a mixture of all these hundreds, maybe even a thousand people screaming and booing at you. Sucks. I just stayed focused and I did my thing, and every time I got through a verse or a chorus, I was like, yeah, I'm here. And um, I made it, I made it all the way through. And they booed off a lot of people that night. They booed me off. <laughs> I would be lying though if I said I wasn't proud of myself. Because I was. Because I'm the type of person you tell me I can't do something, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it better than everybody else. That's just how I am. It's a spirit of it. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was pretty cool. I had my mother there, my sister aunts, uncles, friends, and my grandma. And let me just explain something to you. My grandma, she, she, as much as I love my father, and I do, she was my second parent. She raised me. More even than my mother's at times. She was just the best, and um, it was the very last thing she ever saw me do on stage. So it makes that experience even that much better. And they wanted me, they wanted me to do Showtime at the Apollo, but I couldn't because I was on tour with Jesus Christ Superstar, starring Corey Glover and Ted Neely, which was kind of a big deal back then. And um, only six years ago, big deal. Um, tour was an experience. Ugh, tour is so much fun. You travel all over the United States and Canada. We're in Canada too. I met the very best friends that I still have to this day, and we had just crazy, irresponsible, dramatic fun. I want to explain to you, I don't know if you guys know Jesus Christ Superstar. It has a lot of men in it, in the cast. We had 17 men, and we had seven women. Out of the 17 men in the cast, three of them were straight, single, and under the age of 40. Three for seven single women. You can imagine the drama that went on in that cast, the sexual tension, ridiculous. I will say, I've said it once, and I will say it every show I do. If you are a straight man in musical theater, you get way more ass than you ever should. Way more ass than you ever should. You would never get the play that you get if you were like an architect or some stupid thing like that. You would never get it. Yes, big class. Because these boys on my tour, they thought they were Brad Pitt and friggin' George Clooney. Not so much. But they did, but it was because of us. Because we gave them that. We gave them that ass. 
Well, I just heard about myself. Um, well, we all have our own drama, all the girls had it, and one of my very best friends, who I was not sharing a guy with, came up to me and she said, she said, oh my god, Margaret, I just got the new Amy Winehouse album, and it's so good, and it so describes what we're going through. This one song, it just describes it. And it did. <laughs>
cappuccino I said what kind of man makes cappuccino We left, we left, we left, we left Till tears ran down my face Well my man, you're someone else's man And that ain't the man that I will hold But you keep drawing me in with those big brown lion eyes But you were mine and I was in a park overlooking the whole city and I sat down and I wrote, I wrote a bunch of songs and um, this is one of them. Uh, I wrote all the lyrics and the melody and then the guitar player who was on tour with us, a very talented man named Nicholas Dickerson, wrote the guitar part and 
I haven't sang this song in six years, like for anybody. So it's called Not What I Planned. Saskatoon, Canada, and random place, um, and I didn't have my cell phone on because we were in a different country. And we're checking into the hotel, and a woman at the front desk goes, "Hi, oh, Margaret Spirito? And I said, yeah, that's me. And I'm not even joking, so matter of fact and nonchalant, she goes, oh, you need to call home, you've had a death in your family, and hands me a piece of paper with my grandmother's phone number. Freaked out. My heart dropped. 
I, ha I literally, it was the only time this happened to me I had an outer body experience in front of my whole cast. Screaming, crying, everything's moving in slow motion. I was screaming for someone to give me their phone. Because you have to realize, at this point, I have no idea who died. So I had 8,000 thoughts run through my head in literally five seconds. So like I said before, my grandma was everything. She was like my other parent. She was the strongest, kindest, and sweetest woman I've ever known. And anyone who knew her would say that. She would take people off the streets of Elizabeth, New Jersey, which is ghetto, not a good area. She would take them off the street. She'd see them in the park across the street and say, Are you, is your kid hungry? I'll cook for them. She would make you food. Like, who does that? She wasn't afraid of any, anything. Um, I went home. I left tour. I went to the funeral. And I stayed home for a while. And then I came back to tour. And I could have given a shit about anything. I didn't care. I didn't care about the guy. I didn't care about people complaining about things. I didn't care. All I knew was my grandmother wasn't there anymore. She bought 32 tickets, 32, to, for my family to come see the show when it came to New Jersey that May. And then she wasn't even gonna be there, it sucked. Um, you know, right before I left for tour, she said to me, we were like joking around in conversation. She goes, ah, hon. I'm not going anywhere until I see your name in lights. So if that is not motivation and inspiration to keep going down this road that I've chosen, I don't know what is. You took my hand, you showed me how. You promised me you'd be around. Oh, that's right. I took your word and I believed in everything you said to me. Oh, that's right. This someone said he is from mine, you'd be long gone.
you know, I was leaving my friends, I was leaving my family, I was going to cities totally foreign to me, and hoping and praying that things with this boy worked out. I was scared, I was excited, I was in love, I was all these emotions. Um, moving was a huge risk, and I really didn't know. I had no idea what was going to come of it.
No friends, nothing. We just had each other. And let me tell you something, we're very lucky we didn't fucking kill each other that first year, Ryan and I. LA very quickly made me its bitch. And I will 100% admit that. <laughs> People say if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. And I, I actually I disagree. I think if you can make it in this town, you can make it anywhere. I don't know if that's because New York is kind of like my home and I knew how it all worked there. I don't know. Um, it was rough. It was rough. I was kind of a maniac that first year that we lived here. Um, Ryan was okay. I was, I was the nuts. I couldn't find a job. And I'm not talking like an acting or singing job. I'm talking about a job, like to pay my bills, like anything. It was so difficult. My friends, I missed my friends. Ugh, my friends back home, like back on the East Coast, they're like my family. Not finding those types of relationships out here, it was torturous. I, I was so lonely sometimes, it was sad. And then the whole career thing, you know, you're in the land of, L, you know, LA, TV and film, and I wanted to do TV and film. I, I'm an actor, I like to act, I want to do it. But, you know, all the people out here have all these credits, and I've done it, but I don't have as many credits as them, and you need an agent to bring to the auditions, and I didn't have an agent, no one wanted to work with me because I didn't have enough credits. It was like a friggin' merry-go-round that I was like, get me off this ride now. Don't want to do it. Um, so needless to say, my husband had put up many mood swings, and we all know if you are an artist, a performer of any kind, those mood swings are heightened by about a hundred times more than a normal person. So, yeah, we're lucky we didn't kill each other. Um, we actually got through it. Three and a half years later, we're still here, we're still kicking, and um, we decided somewhere along those lines to get married. We. Ooh, it was a big decision, and it is. Getting married is a very big step. I knew I was going to marry him. The minute I kissed him, I knew I was going to marry him. He didn't know it, but I knew it. It's true. That's the honest to God truth. And I was not taking this lately. Like, Ryan and I, we had both been in relationships where we got hurt. We had both hurt each other. We saw our parents in really crappy marriages, and we wanted to take things seriously. We went to premarital counseling. We joined our bank accounts. We talked about what we wanted. We meant fucking business. I left New York for this kid. This was no joke. This was going <laughs> on. And getting married, it's scary. You know, it's scary, it's exciting, it's fun, it's a happy time, it's a confusing time. And anyone who says it's not all those things, they're lying to you. Not everyone says it, but it is. It's all those emotions. Um, I came across the song, One and Only, by Adele, about a year ago, and I was pissed. Do you ever listen to a song and you get mad that you didn't write it? Because <laughs> I mean, no, seriously, yes, see? It happens to me all the time. Like, I'll be like, God damn it! This is the stuff I need to be doing! And that song, every lyric Ryan and I have said to each other at some point in our relationship, every lyric, um, and I really hope all of you get to say that to someone or, or have said that to someone as well. Thinking of your face, will I ever know? 
invite the room. So he, to these two guys are worth much more than I can ever pay them. They really did this for me out of the kindness of their heart, and um, I thank you both. I couldn't have done this without you. Anthony Starville, Devin McNichol, find them, Facebook, Twitter, all that fun stuff. Um, I have to thank Meredith, Meredith Scott Williams. She's over here. Meredith directed this for me. She helps me, she helped me get it all structured. And she, I'm gonna tell you quickly how we met. We met two years ago. I was doing, for the record, Buzz Lerman over at the former show at Bar, in Rockwell. But back when it was the sexy show at Bar, um, Meredith came and she went nuts after every one of my songs. And I was like, who is this lady going crazy? I don't think I know her. And her buddy, Brian, said to me, you have to meet Meredith, she thinks you're amazing. And so I was like, oh, then yes, I have to meet Meredith. Um, but really, she, she really believes in me. And she believes that I have true talent and she she doesn't care that I haven't been in a movie or a TV show or anything. She just sees something in me. And when I was looking for a director, I wanted someone who was excited about working with me, who wasn't doing it just to get off on their own beautiful talent. Um, and she is talented. This woman works more than any other actress I know in Los Angeles. So she's just, that is true. Um, she's so talented. She did it out of the kindness of her heart. I have learned so much from working with her, and I hope to work with her much more in the future. So, thank you, Meredith. Uh, um, I want to thank all of you, because without you, I would have no one to sing for. So, thank you for coming. Thanks for sitting here while we started late. Um, thanks for sitting in traffic on your way here, because I'm sure you all did. Good news is, hopefully it's subsided once I let you all out. Um, for real though, find me on Twitter, Facebook, Margaret M. Spirito, my website, margaretmspirito.com. For real, find me. I love to sing, I love to sing at parties, at weddings, I love to sing, I love to, I love to act. Broadway, Broadway! Yes, put me on Broadway, put me in a movie, I won't complain. Um, I want to thank my husband, because he's awesome, and he supports me through all this. And he's, People ask what's the key to like being happy, and I say we su just support each other in what we do, because that really is the key. Um, please, I want you, I beg you, take care of your servers this evening. When I'm not doing this, that's what I'm doing, and it's a shitty job. And maybe I, did, I think it's a shitty job. Let me take that away. I'm just over it. Um, I've been doing it for way too long. It's literally hurting me. Um, so, but really, they work very hard. They work very hard, so please make sure you do right by them before you leave. The bartender as well. Don't, don't be cheap. That's my advice. Um, so, yeah, so we've come to the end of the show, and I can't end it without doing a song by my idol, my inspiration, my favorite crazy, Janis Joplin. Um, I had the pleasure and the honor, two years ago, of singing her music for her brother and her sister at an audition. It was an audition for a new show that they're doing now about her music and her life, and her brother and sister are co-producing it with other people. And they called me back like to play their sister, and I was, I was dumbfounded. I was so honored that these people thought I could hold a candle to what their sister was. Um, and I had no issues telling them that as I left the call back. Oh, what an honor, thank you. Um, <laughs> Janice Joplin sang from her gut. She left nothing to the imagination. And even though people relentlessly made fun of how she looked, she was the most beautiful woman in the room when she sang. Every night, she gave her audience a piece of her heart. And tonight, I give you mine.